0.01 seconds. A sliver in time so small that by the end of this sentence it's already occurred 1,000 times over. In 70 years of Formula 1 racing, with over 1,000 races in the record books, only one can hold the distinction of being the closest finish to a Formula 1 Grand Prix. Today we delve deeper into that race, the 1971 Italian Grand Prix. Welcome to 70's Tales, Episode 3, The Finest Margins. Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to 70s Tales, a look back at some of the most notable stories from the 1970s. This is the third episode of this six episode season, so do consider checking out those first two videos and keep an eye out for the second half of the series very soon. As noted today we look at the 1971 Italian Grand Prix held at the historic Monza circuit. A race that not only holds the record for closest finish between first and second places, but that record perhaps overshadows the fact that the next three drivers also finished within one second of the eventual winner. Without any further ado, let's get into this epic race. The Italian Grand Prix played host to round 9 of 11 in the 1971 season, yet despite there still being a few rounds to go, the championship had already been wrapped up. Jackie Stewart in his Tyrrell had enjoyed a dominant season, comfortably claiming his second world championship. Entering the race, Stewart had 51 points, only one fewer than if you were to combine the points for Ix's Ferrari in second, Peterson's March in third, and Fittipaldi's Lotus in fourth. With the championship decided in Stewart's favour, there was optimism that some of the other teams and drivers could take advantage and launch themselves into the spotlight. This optimism was enhanced further when rumours circulated that Enzo Ferrari would not be sending any of his cars for their home race. Ultimately this wasn't sustained, and Ferrari entered both Ix and Clay Regazzoni, but I doubt the organisers at Monza were best pleased as this rumour caused a severe lack of fans for Friday practice. Fortunately the crowd poured in for Saturday's running, with a large number of drivers in with a shot of pole position. A lot has changed in Formula 1 over the last 50 years. Doing everything possible to get a slipstream on a flying lap in qualifying isn't one of them. With drivers slowing down in order to find the perfect spot to feed in, there was a mixture of drivers finding the right time, and perhaps in more circumstances, just tripping over one another. The winner at the last race, Joe Siffert in his BRM, tangled with Chris Amon in his Matra, but ultimately the Kiwi found the perfect gap and used the slipstream of Tim Schenken's Brabham to set the fastest lap of the session ahead of Jackie X in the Ferrari. Now call me a skeptic here, but what happens next is a little fishy. Eamon's time of 1.22.4 was nearly half a second quicker than that of X, and just so happened to be the fastest lap ever recorded in a Formula 1 championship race but it very nearly didn't end up that way. When the provisional results of qualifying were shared amongst the teams, it was Jackie Ix who was deemed to be on pole position. Matra, naturally, challenged the call, and questioned why Eamon's fastest lap had not been recognised, to which the timekeepers responded by saying that they had recorded the time, but didn't believe it to be real. Fortunately for Matra, other teams on the grid believed the time to be legitimate, and it was decided that Eamon would start from the front. Is it sheer coincidence that the timekeepers decided not to acknowledge a time that eventually put a Ferrari off of pole position? You be the judge on that. With Eamon and Ix occupying the front row, it was an all BRM row 2, showing how useful their V12 engine could be on a circuit such as Monza. The winner from Austria, Siffert, would start third, and Howden Ganley fourth. Francois Sever was the fastest non-V12 engine user in fifth. For the adoring Tafosi, all eyes were on Jackie Ix to secure an early lead, and indeed it was a Ferrari that led after lap one. But it wasn't the driver everyone was expecting. From a lowly grid position of eighth, Clay Ragazzoni took an early lead, with Siffert and Ix struggling early. The lead group comprised of about six cars, and the lead switched on almost every lap, such was the power of Slipstream. Regazzoni conceded his early lead to Peterson in his march, and both Tyrrells of Sever and Jackie Stewart held the lead inside the first 15 laps. 
Interestingly, prize money for this race was not only decided as a result of position at the end of the Grand Prix, but also as a result of where you were placed at the ends of laps 13, 26 and 39. Perhaps it was therefore unsurprising to see laps 11 and 12 as less of a spectacle before everyone went for it on lap 13. As it happened, it was Peterson that led at that stage. With the fragility of engines in the 1970s, a high-speed race at Monza could often turn into one of attrition. As evidence, Stewart dropped out on lap 15, and within three laps it was disaster for Ferrari, as both Ix and Regazzoni retired due to expiring engines. With Siffert and Eamon both struggling too, this gave a great opportunity for certain drivers who would not usually find themselves in the limelight. The lead continued to change hands. Peterson and Sever remained in the fight out front and were now joined by Mike Halewood, who had come all the way from 17th on the grid. Siffert temporarily recovered and got back amongst the leaders, but a jammed gearbox hindered his progress and left him well off the front. Fortunately for BRM, Howden Ganley and Peter Geffen were still well in the fight and they used each other to get amongst the leading pack. Much like Siffert, Eamon also got back into contention following early issues, and his challenge was much more sustained. With five laps to go, the lead having changed countless times, there was to be one last push for the line between six drivers. A massive opportunity beckoned, since none of these drivers had ever claimed a race win. Chris Eamon, Undoubtedly the most experienced of the bunch and almost unanimously agreed the best driver never to have won an F1 championship race. Ronnie Peterson, who had been in contention since the start. Francois Sever, looking to break out of the shadow of his double world champion winning teammate. Mike Halewood, the multiple time motorcycle champion, looking to become the first winner for the Surtees outfit. And then the two BRMs of Howden Ganley and Peter Geffen. Geffen having just one career point to his name, Ganley having none whatsoever. Six drivers soon became five as Chris Amon's bad luck realised it was getting late and needed to make an appearance at some point. In preparation for the battle ahead of him, Amon took off his top face visor that had become dirty as the race had gone on, leaving him with just a clean one to use for the rest of the race. At least that's how it should have gone. Eamon accidentally got rid of both, leaving him no option but to slow down and put himself out of the fight. The other five cars swapped the lead multiple times each lap in the hope that they would time a move correctly to come home first. At the end of lap 54 of 55, it was Peterson who led, ahead of Sever, Halewood, Geffen and Ganley. On the back straight of that final lap, it was Sever who held the lead, with Peterson directly behind him. Under braking for that final corner, it was Peterson who held the advantage, but Peter Geffen, up the inside of Parabolica, desperately got the best exit and took the lead. The other three all got back in the slipstream, but the run to the line was just short enough for Geffen to cling on. When I see cling, I literally mean it. 0.01 seconds separating himself and Peterson at the chequered flag. Sever rounded out the podium 0.09 seconds further back. Poor Mike Halewood managed to finish within 0.18 seconds of the win whilst also not being on the podium. Whilst Howard Ganley was an eternity back at 0.61 seconds. Little did he know at the time, but the 1971 Italian Grand Prix would be just the start of Ronnie Peterson's complex relationship with the circuit. Peterson would avenge the narrow loss in 1971 with three wins between 1973 and 1976. But just as ecstasy was in Peterson's Monza future, so was tragedy. A collision in 1978 ending the Swede's life. Sever would have to wait just two more races for that first win. For Eamon, Ganley and Halewood, it never came. And for Geffen, the win at Monza has gone down in history with his name firmly etched in the record books, but unfortunately the win wasn't the springboard to success he would have hoped for. Just one more F1 point would follow in Geffen's career at the following year's Italian Grand Prix. 
So ends the tale of one of the most thrilling finishes in F1 history. And there will be many that argue it's not deserving of a place amongst the most exciting, and would argue it is without a doubt the most exciting. Thank you for joining me for the story, and I hope you enjoyed. As ever, please do leave a like if you enjoyed, and leave a comment, let me know what you think. And if there is a race you'd like me to cover, do let me know, and that might form the basis of a future episode. We're halfway through this season now, but I'll see you shortly for episode four. I've been Ben Hocking. Keep breaking late.